back to the Messy Reformation. My name's Jason Rice. I'm the lead pastor at Faith Community CRC in Beaverdam, Wisconsin. My co-host is Willie Cronkey. He's a member at Pease CRC in Pease, Minnesota. But unfortunately, he wasn't able to be with us for this interview. We're just a couple of guys who love the Christian Reformed Church and want to see Reformation happen in our denomination. But we recognize that whenever Reformation happens, things get messy. And as we're watching Reformation happen in the CRC, things are getting messy. So we're taking the opportunity to talk to pastors throughout our denomination to find out what's going on in the Christian Reformed Church, but also to talk about what Reformation might look like. If you haven't already, take a moment, click subscribe so you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes. We are dropping episodes every single Monday. Also, head on over to our website at themessyreformation.com. You'll find our podcast there, but you'll also find some articles there on a regular basis. With all that said, we're going to get to this week's episode, which is part one of our conversation with Josh Christoffels. So, Josh, why don't you kick us off by telling us a little bit about yourself and your family and the church that you're at? Yeah, I'm... uh married to Karen, and my wife is a nurse, and I have five children. We uh, are a busy family, but enjoy uh, five children all the way from ages 14 down to two. And so uh, I am at the Hammond Christian Reformed Church, and I was just moved here not too long ago since uh, last August, and so have been enjoying uh, getting to know a new congregation here and uh, moved to this area in the vicinity of Chicago uh, not too long ago. So Hammond is just on the, just over the Indiana border on the uh, south east side of Chicago. Okay, and what church did you serve uh, prior to that? I was in uh, Chandler, Minnesota. So I served there for six years and uh, moved here since then. And so uh, I can tell you a little bit about how I got here, I guess, if you'd like. Yeah. Um, I was kind of looking in this area of Chicago because of a preaching course that was offered. It's called the Charles Simeon Trust and the Chicago Course on Preaching. And so I looked into maybe serving a church in this area. I was uh, at the point in my ministry after six years where I was looking for a new church uh, back in Minnesota. And so, yeah, I found uh, Hammond, it was all according to the province of, providence of the Lord that uh, I was able to find this uh, church that was uh, looking for a pastor. And uh, the church here is a, a smaller church. You know, they have around 30, 40 people on a Sunday. And so uh, I can serve here part time and then I can go to the class uh, up in Sh- Hyde Park area of Chicago part time. So I do that two days a week and I've really been enjoying it. We're joining together with other pastors and talking about preaching. So it's a great uh, thing to do, kind of a cohort and a a preaching lab or preaching workshop that we're looking together at texts of scripture, interpreting it for context and everything, and then uh, trying to think through how you're going to put that in a message. Yeah, that's awesome. So I was trying, I've heard of the Charles Simeon Trust, who, uh, who kind of oversees that, or is that an entity of its own? I guess it's its own entity. They have a board. Uh, it was originally started, I believe, by a church in the Chicago area or Wheaton, Illinois area, uh, by uh, Kent Hughes and his church. And then uh, now the board is taken over by, I think it's Dave Helm is the one that's kind of in charge. And so he's got a church in the area of the University of Chicago. And um, so it's in the Hyde Park area of Chicago. And they are overseeing it. And so, yeah, it's, it's run by uh, a number of different pastors in the area. A lot of people come in to lecture and in, into the course. And so like my friend, Eric Bukema, uh, he is the one that originally told me about it. And he's been involved in the course for a while. So, Oh, that's cool. So, yeah, I know Derek well. He's a, he's a friend of mine, too. So what uh, what was it about the Charles Simeon Trust that kind of drew you to want to be a part of the, that program? Um, sometimes when you're in the ministry, you can get into preaching ruts, I guess you could say. You can understand your weaknesses um, and uh, you can take shortcuts. Of course, ministry 
it's always uh, busy. And so uh, you're doing whatever you can to get those sermons out every week. And I, I had two sermons a uh, Sunday uh, back in Chandler. And so it's quite uh, busy. And uh, you understand after a while your weaknesses uh, with preaching. Um, I kind of uh, could, uh, I experienced criticism once in a while with, with my preaching. And um, so I just really wanted to study the word of God and get back into it. And it's a little bit different focus than seminary. So like in seminary, you're looking at systematic theology. You're looking at the biblical languages. Uh, but here it's, it's a little bit different focus. It's focused on the English Bible and you can, uh, you can read the Bible and just interpret the text, but it's very exegetical. It's very scriptural and I love it. And then you think through how you can apply it. And uh, one of the best parts is your uh, fellow people taking the course with you. So you've got a really wide variety of people, uh, not only uh, pastors, but a couple elders and deacons that have taken the course and which is amazing. I'd love to have an elder like that who could uh, preach a sermon. Uh, so it's a great opportunity. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. We talked about that um, here in, in classes, Wisconsin, a few of us pastors uh, creating something like that on our own with us and some of our uh, guys who are licensed to exhort to get together on a regular basis and talk through passages and how we would apply it and how we would preach it. And so it's just a good, I, it's a, it's a really cool uh, way to, to use the body of Christ, right. And the various gifts that we have to kind of um, kind of a communal way to look at sermon preparation. So yeah, it's cool. Now, have you, did you grow up in the Christian reformed church, Josh? I did. Yeah. Um, my dad was a pastor in the Christian Reformed Church, and he still is, but he's retired now. Uh, so I grew up in California, and my dad pastored a church in Artesia, California. And then we moved to New Jersey when I was 10 years old. So coast to coast. Uh, wow. Then I graduated from uh, high school there and then went to Dort. So um, yeah, but pretty much born and bred CRC. Okay. And so you went to Dort, and then uh, where did you go to seminary? I went to Westminster, so there was a few years in between uh, college and seminary, so I served as a missionary in China, as an English teacher missionary in China for a few years, uh, was there before I met my wife, and as I was meeting my wife there, uh, we met actually in Grand Rapids as we were going through training to get out there to teach English, and um, so yeah, and then I went to, then uh, we moved to Sioux Falls. In South Dakota, lived there for a couple of years, uh, where I got actually at, at the time I got my teaching degree, uh, and because I never had teaching emphasis at Dort, so I did teaching, and then I taught for a year in a middle school, and then we were called back to China for a year, and uh, my wife and I and our son was two at the time, went to China and taught English, and that's uh, really the point where the Lord called me to seminary to the ministry. And um, it was kind of, a, I don't know if about dramatic, but it was, a, I wasn't necessarily planning <laughs> to uh, go into the ministry, but the Lord had other plans for me. And I, I guess I was trying to get away from my family, right? My family's profession a little bit. Sure. Uh, but but uh, I'm, I'm glad that I've been where I've been and I've seen the Lord lead all, all along. Yeah, amen. I uh, I see that in in a number of people whose dads were pastors, and and uh, there's 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 some goodness in that, and and not just becoming a pastor because your dad was a pastor and your grandpa was a pastor or whatever, but really waiting to hear the the call of God on your life before you go. So there's there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes there is a little bit of a rebellious spirit there, I suppose. But <laughs> what uh, um, I, I want to jump back, what. Did you did you feel a call into into missions? Is that why you pursued teaching English in in China, or or was that something that kind of fell in your lap, or or what was what was going on there? Uh, some of it was not a whole lot of direction uh, getting towards the end of my college life, but I knew I wanted to do something with ministry and, and missions if possible. Um, I was. Uh, I had gone on mission trips in high school. We went out to West Virginia from New Jersey to uh, minister to the poor there. Um, I went to Nicaragua in college as a with a mission group. So part of me really loved that. And then 
uh, I think this recruiter or something came to campus with uh, with this teaching organization to China. And so uh, I looked into it, did some research, and it, it really was something I wanted to do, something I was able to do. I was thankful that uh, that at that point in my life, it worked out. So that's what that's the direction I went. And then ever since then, I've I fell in love with missions, fell in love with the people, uh, especially in China. And uh, I just love to uh, to pray for the, the church there. You know, the uh, the church, there struggles. Uh, they they have uh, issues with, you know, government oppression. And but uh, the Lord has been faithful. And a lot of these pastors are uh, bivocational or or mostly uh, lay lay pastors. But they are um, they're faithful. And I'm just so thankful for how the Lord works with them. Yeah. Amen. So when you were there, um, and maybe this isn't something you want to dive into, but just out of curiosity, I've done a lot of reading and study about the Chinese church. Were you part of uh, like the house church movement there? Or did were you part of like a three self church? Or, or what was that experience for you in China? I wasn't part of the house church. Uh, it, our organization had some rules about that, uh, where if you even just go and worship with them, uh, that can bring danger or harm to them uh, as a foreigner yeah. coming in. So we had to be careful about that. Uh, we would attend occasionally the Three Self Church. And uh, I can just remember one time we we met this guy in the train and uh, ended up getting to our city and invited him to come to church. I didn't think he was going to show up to church, but he did. And it was amazing that he could sit there uh, in the worship service with us. He had never been in a church before. Oh. And uh, we could tell him the elements of the service, what's going on. And we actually had communion that day. Uh, we could explain to him the liturgy. And uh, he was translating for us a bit. And um, it was just amazing. Later on, he professed faith in Christ. So uh, we were just amazed at the way that the Lord works. Yeah, amen. So what was the what was the the background to then your call from China into uh, like a pastoral ministry? Yeah, I think at uh, at that time. So this is the uh, we had gone back to China a second time after we were married after we had our our two year old son, and um, I could tell the uh, the depth the lack of depth I had in the scriptures. Uh, we were doing some Bible studies. We were teaching students, uh, whether they're unbelievers or believers, the Bible. And I, I, I knew uh, how weak I was in that area, and I wanted to pursue that. Um, and, I, and I just got to thinking about it. I couldn't see any other thing I'd rather be doing than to be uh, ministering to God's people. And I came to understand what, what a shepherd means. And I guess that, mm. that's happened through ministry a lot more than it has even before. So what what it means to shepherd God's people and not only feed the flock, give them the word, but also uh, you you have uh, correction or uh, or care, uh, the care of shepherding someone. Yeah. Yeah. There there are some things uh, with pastoral ministry that definitely just need to be learned through experience and uh, learned through failure, too, really, I I think. Uh I've, I've been kind of laughing and I, I guess I'm still a young pastor, so I shouldn't be laughing too much, but there's a, there's kind of this movement out there of uh, articles being written on things I never learned in seminary and, and, uh, or even there's almost, I, I keep hearing people talk about how they almost feel like their seminary education failed them, failed to prepare them for ministry um, because it didn't get into all of the really practical aspects of ministry. And I, I don't know. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, but for personally, I, I tend to tell people, I don't think you can learn those things in the classroom. Anyways, you just have to be kind of baptized by fire, thrown in, figure out how to lead an elders meeting and you're going to fail at it and, and be thrown into shepherd somebody through a death in the family or through a cancer diagnosis. Um, you're never really going to learn that in, in a classroom anyways. And so, um, my, my worry has been um, one of the things um, I've been fairly vocal on some of my frustration with my uh, seminary education at Calvin, because I felt like we had very few um, classes focused on theology and, and scripture. And a lot of them were practical ministry, 
classes um, because everybody was saying we needed more practical ministry classes. And I kept thinking, man, I feel like we're, we're sacrificing the theological depth of our pastors trying to go with this practical thing. But I don't know. What, what do you think, Josh? Yeah, I think there is a place for both, uh, for both the practical instruction and the theological. But I think you really do need that theological foundation. Uh, I, I was blessed to have that experience with Westminster Seminary in California. That's where I went. And um, I, they, they're very rigorous as far as the theology. And so I just loved it. Um, we had the focus on the confessions. Uh, then I did the EPMC program at Calvin. And so then that really, uh, I could see that world as well. And so you can see some benefits of some of the practical things. Um, I do b- agree with you that uh, you really can't teach it all <laughs> in seminary. You're, not, you're never going to be uh, re- ready or prepared through what they're, what they're teaching there. You, they're not going to be able to teach you uh, how to minister in a funeral, or uh, they can give you some practical advice with that, but uh, it comes with experience and failure, really. And I, I've kind of experienced that a little bit too. <laughs> so, Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, I, I learned how to help disciple. Um, you know, I was a youth pastor for about 11 years and uh, I feel bad for my volunteers. I had a pretty large youth ministry team. There were uh, six other adults with me. And I feel bad for them. The first three or four years of ministry, I did not do a good job and I did not treat them very well. And I had to go back to them repeatedly and say, sorry, I screwed that one up. Sorry, I screwed that one up. Yeah, I shouldn't have said that. Shouldn't have done that. And uh, I was a lot, but they stuck with me. Thankfully, they were faithful. And uh, we, we did, our, our whole group did ministry together for about uh, 10 or 11 years straight. Um, which was really cool, but I had to learn a lot just through, just through failing and, and messing up. And, and I, I use this example quite a bit, but you know, I, just this last week, um, I had a call from somebody in my church and they had just, uh, had an MRI and they found a growth and it might be cancerous. And they wanted me to come over and sit with them and talk and give some pastoral guidance. And I say, um, you're not going to learn how to do that in a classroom. <laughs> You know, I mean, you can have, they could tell you some ideas and and give you some guidelines. Sure. But, but really whenever we're stepping into a situation like that, we really have no idea what we're doing and on, on what, in the one hand, um, or what's going to happen or what you're going to say. You just, I tell people, I pray my whole way over into that situation to say, Lord, help, Lord, help me, Lord, help me spirit guide me. And then I say a prayer as I'm going through the door and I sit down and and trust the the spirit's going to lead me as I as I have that conversation. But it's not something you learn. Yeah, it's not something you learn in a classroom. It's something you have to learn by faith. Really, you trust. All right, God's going to lead me in this. So here we go. Yeah, I think that that trust thing is huge. I mean, that's so biblical and scriptural. You think about Second Corinthians, where Paul says, "My grace is sufficient for you." I think I listened to your sermon on that, by the way. That was good, and um, <laughs> uh, that's true. I mean, you just uh, you just put the put the trust in the Lord, and you have to uh, go uh, into it with with trust. It's it's more teaching about yourself, <laughs> teaching ministering to yourself in some ways uh, before you can minister to others. But yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, being someone who uh, grew up in the CRC and uh, and grew up with a dad as a CRC pastor, I'm sure you've got a pretty good handle on uh, kind of the Christian reform culture and and our heritage. And so if I was, you know, we typically ask people, what are some of the strengths that you see in the CRC? So what, what are some of the strengths you see even historically, but even now as a denomination? Yeah, I think that uh, the the love of the confessions is, has really been one of the strengths of the CRC. We uh, have this form of subscription, or uh, that's what it used to be called. Uh, now it's the covenant for office bearers. And um, I think there were some forces that tried to uh, whittle away at that and make it less binding, less uh, less uh, strength, uh, our ability to, to uh, hold on to it. But um, we still subscribe to it, at least on paper. And so I think that's been a really big strength that uh, we agree that the confessions of the church are the very, uh, are, you know, the word of God, or insofar as they agree with the word of God. And so um, I think the confessions are a strength 
I think that missions has historically been very uh, faithful in the CRC. Um, I got a little glimpse of that uh, working with uh, Christian Reformed World Missions. Now it's Resonate, but uh, I partnered with them when I when I lived in China, and um, I just loved how uh, they were committed to the gospel. I do think that's been dwindling a bit in the CRC. Uh, in the past, there was a lot more missionary sense. Now it seems like they're doing a lot more partnering with other organizations, and so it's not as specifically directed to gospel ministry as it was. But um, that historically has been very good. Uh, many people in the CRC have gone out and been faithful and did work in translation, did work in uh, working in faraway places and missions. And um, so, yeah, those are some of the things I think. Uh, the confessions, the uh, missions, I uh, believe, yeah, just are uh, in, a, in a local setting where I grew up, you know, New Jersey, California, and, and then uh, now Minnesota. It's been uh, the local congregation has really been a place to feel like family. I think that's been a great thing for us. And uh, the family feel that you have working together uh, and feeling like you belong. I think that's a, a great thing. Yeah. Amen. I think that that family feeling um, comes uh, out of our theology. I, I always tell people it comes from our covenantal theology that it's not a, uh, even though not everybody fully grasps it, I would assume in our churches, um, but it just kind of bleeds through into how we do things and how we think and just our heritage that we're in this together. It's not a bunch of individuals just showing up for worship and, and doing life, but we're doing this uh, covenanting together. And I've heard that in almost every CRC church I've been a part of when new members come in, they're like, man, it just seems like a family. There's something different here in this church than other churches I've been a part of. And um, I think it boils down to our understanding of, of covenant and how we're in this together. Yeah, I really found that to be true in my current uh, church here in Hammond. And uh, historically, this wasn't your typical Dutch church. It, it started as a mission church. It was kind of a mission outpost. And they would hire, originally, they hired an, an evangelist, uh, a lay leader, to come and uh, start the church. And so uh, eventually it became established. And uh, now it's a uh, Christian Reformed Church, and, and we have a building. And uh, But it has that feel a bit of... Uh, diversity. And so we have some diversity of different ethnic backgrounds and um, a lot of people that have been through a lot of trauma in our church. So whether it's been divorced or singles or, or um, our widows, um, a lot of people that uh, just love being together. And so I find that to be really true in my current context. Yeah. Hey man, there's something about that because my current church also was, a, I mean, it was a church plant 60 years ago, but it wasn't you know, it was, uh, there was a bunch of kind of more Dutch reformed communities up north. And this was a bigger community that was primarily uh, Catholic and Lutheran. And so they, they wanted to get a reformed presence in the community. So they planted our, our church. And um, so, yeah, we don't have, I would say maybe 10, 15% of the people in our church have our Dutch and have a reformed heritage. Most of them are coming out of the, the Catholic church or the Lutheran church. Um, but and they all come at part of part of coming is feeling uh, that sense of family. And it was interesting. I, I got one of those uh, reports through. Uh, oh, shoot. Now I lost it. Uh, Peter Kelder. Anyways, you can get a community report kind of talks about the demographics of your community and and all of that. And so when I first moved here, I, I had him print off one of those just so I could get a better feel of the com new community I was in. And interestingly, the top two things that people were looking for in a church and our community were um, a warm, welcoming community and good preaching. And, uh, and I was like, boy, historically, those have been two strengths of the CRC, really, that, that we're a warm, welcoming community, and uh, we focus heavily on preaching, and we have an emphasis on that. And uh, most CRC preachers that I know are, are pretty good preachers of the word. And so I thought, man, we're really sitting pretty good to, to reach and have an impact on our community here. I've also had the joy of experiencing some of the stuff with, uh, with uh, Christian Reform World Missions, um, too. I, I was able to go and uh, 
spend a five week internship in the Dominican Republic through them and get to see the fruit of uh, just the, the CRC's faithful presence in the Dominican Republic, which is a pretty cool story that they, uh, the CRC church actually started there because of back to God ministries. There was a people in a little, a little batay, a little village out in the middle of nowhere um, heard, and I forget who it was now, but the, the Spanish speaking part of, of back to God radio. And uh, they heard his sermons and decided they wanted to start a church. And so they just started a church and they put Christian reformed church on the top of the, the building. Cause that's all they knew. Um, and then they wrote to uh, our synod and said, send us a missionary. We want to, we need you to come here and help us plant churches. And I think that was back in the late sixties, early seventies. And I think when I was there a few years ago, I think there's like over 200, 230 churches throughout, um, throughout the Dominican Republic. Now they have their own organization. They've got their own synods and gatherings. And so it's a, it's a pretty cool work of, of the Christian Reformed Church, our, our missions and ministry. And I, I really would like to see us rethink how we're funding everything. I think we're, that's a big thing, big topic right now is ministry shares. Um, because we started pulling out mi missionaries from all these places as soon as our budget started cutting. Um, and I thought, boy, that's a poor place to start cutting. Um, there's a lot of other things I think we could start cutting in our, in our, throughout our denomination um, before we start cutting back on, on, on our missionaries. Yeah, you see how uh, Back to God has really morphed and changed over the years as well. And you see that, I mean, that's connected to this community uh, here in Southwest Chicago and or Southeast Chicago. Um, it's really kind of lamentable. I think that there's less focus on the actual back to God hour. Uh, there, we always had very good preachers and very good uh, ministry leaders in each of these language areas. And they were doing direct gospel work. They were doing direct uh, ministry on the radio and uh, another uh, one of the pastors is Pastor Madine, and he is uh, he was the uh, a while back the uh, the Muslim speaker or, uh, ministered to Muslims uh, it, with Back to God, and so he's a member of our church now, and so it's been really mm -hmm. great to uh, talk to him. But um, yeah, it, it's a little bit sad about the state of things now. I think it seems like I know they have a radio program, but it's I, honestly, I don't know much about it. <laughs> uh, I think it's online, and um, I don't know how much is uh, on the radio anymore. I think they said they they stopped actually broadcasting on the radio because it was expensive. It was more than a million dollars every year to to broadcast. Uh, but then I compare that to the banner, and it costs at least a million dollars to send the banner to every household. Uh, yeah. So uh, you uh, wonder where the priorities are, and. Yeah, yeah there, there's always that temptation out there to, to cut that because uh, podcasting is cheap, right? That's, that's why I can do it, uh, because it's cheap and, and uh, running a blog, right? They've got various uh, blogs out there where people are writing. I do some writing um, for Family Fire, which is part of that. Um, but they have, they have various other ones. You know, they've, they've become really a broad ministry. And uh, um, but yeah, it is lamentable. I was just reading this week. I was reading um, James Scopp's, um our our family album or something, a history of the Christian Reformed Church, and he was talking about the founding of Back to God Hour and and all the different guys who've been radio voices for that and preachers on that. And I was lamenting that this past week too, thinking, man, we've lost that. We don't we don't really have a voice for the CRC, or at least one that that we want to rally around as a CRC as well. And so we, we're kind of, uh, we, I feel at times like we're like, we don't want to have a Pope obviously, but, but at sometimes we're kind of like a rudderless ship as a denomination, just kind of floating around right now. Whereas, uh, like, whereas throughout the history, you know, we, the banner even was, was functioning as this kind of guide, you know, guide for our denomination on, you know, when World War II broke out, people were like, how do we think about this? How do we interact with this? And they would they would go to the banner to try to find some solid guidance by uh, by H.J. Uh, Kuiper, I think, was was the editor back then. And 
And so, um, but now I don't know very many people who are, <laughs> I know my wife said I'm ripping on the banner too much lately, but, but either way, I just, I was like, I don't know very many people who are like, man, there's these really difficult things going on in the world. I better open the banner and try to figure out how to think through these things. I think we're, we're looking other places and that, that saddens me because I think we have such a good history and, and such solid resources. And, and obviously I think our theology is right on the money. Um, we could we could really speak to some of these issues in a powerful way. Yeah, uh, it, 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 you wonder if it's a chicken or the egg kind of thing too. Like, it, is it because I, I think it's because of what's on the ground too? It's the div- divisions that we have uh, as churches and the the diversity that's there, where which is not a good kind of diversity. <laughs> uh, so much uh, away from the word of God and the scriptures. And um, so I think if, if the banner was, yeah, uh, I think it'd be hard to, it'd be, they have a hard job. That's for sure. Cause they almost have to cater to everybody and yeah. uh, people will complain if it's uh, too confessional and biblical. So. Yeah. So I, I like to ask people this question because I think we're all feeling that as we interact with people in the pew that um, just even in the CRC, which has been known for being really biblically solid and faithful denomination, um, our members are increasingly becoming biblically illiterate. And, uh, and so how do, you, how do you think we got to where we're at right now as a denomination? Hmm. One thing I'm learning in the uh, Charles Simeon Trust is that uh, they really care about getting back to discipleship and uh, teaching the the word of God and getting people to uh, read the word and uh, teach it. (laughs) And I think we did that in the CRC. We've we've done it pretty well. Uh, But then you get into sometimes these studies like Coffee Break and other materials that are put out. They're good materials. They, They focus on the Bible. Uh, but you have sometimes kind of this reader response thing where you go around the circle and you share about uh, your feeling of the text, but you don't have someone who's trained in the text who is uh, looking at the the text and uh, what's the structure of the text. How does that lead to the main point of the text? And then uh, how do we apply this specifically to our lives? Um, One of the lectures I heard at Charles Simeon is uh, was a, uh, a woman who came and talked about what she does with women's ministry. Uh, they go around the country doing workshops and training women. And, you know, it's a Titus type of thing where you can teach women, teach other other women. And I think for us uh, as complementarians, we have to be careful. We have to do it well. We have to um, teach uh, the Bible well and uh, do women's ministry well. And so why not have women teaching other women? In, uh, in, in training them better for uh, understanding the Bible itself and teaching the Bible instead of uh, teaching kind of your feeling about it. So I think it's discipleship. I think it's, it's caring uh, for what the word says and getting that out and teaching it in, the, in a biblical way. That's all we have for this week. Stay tuned next week for part two of our conversation with Josh Christoffels. Until then, don't forget this is Christ's church, and he bought it with his blood. And we've been warned that wolves will come in trying to destroy the flock. So keep a close watch on your life and on your doctrine. Preach the word in season and out of season, and keep fighting the good fight in this messy Reformation. <laughs>